2 Samuel chapter 15, we are in part two of this chapter. And it's one of the heavy chapters. Remember last time we, uh, we opened this chapter, I asked if anybody's been betrayed. My wife raised her hand. I said, I was sorry, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, 37 years I've been saying I'm sorry. But uh, if you've ever been betrayed, hurt, burned, backstabbed, um, I'm not trying to open up old wounds, but this is a very emotional chapter. And so we'll, we'll look at, uh, we'll back up a little bit, give you an intro and pick it up back in verse 23. But let's pray. I think that's important. Father, we thank you so much, God, for this Wednesday night. We thank you for gathering us here. We pray for those who want to be here but can't, God. We pray for those in the hospital, those who are sick, those who are not feeling well, God, those who have to work, God, those who... Uh, Love your word, love worship, love God, and love the body. And uh, just be with us, God, because we're here, and, and we just come to hear from you, God. Uh, I have notes here, God. I thank you for the time of study, but go beyond that, Lord. Would you please speak to us uh, individually and congregationally, Lord God? I also want to pray for the youth, God, that you'd bless them, Father, our children's ministry, uh, the, the toddlers and infant, God and all the ministries that are going on behind the scenes yeah, that we take so for granted. Thank you, God, for, for those who come and volunteer and are excited to serve you, to glorify you. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Everyone set. Amen. Well, last time, again, we were together. We had opened this chapter, and we read where Absalom, who was David's own son, committed treason, began and is committing treason against his dad, the king of Israel. Absalom, as we look back, wasn't really so happy with his father. He wasn't happy with just killing his half-brother Amnon for raping his sister Tamar. He now wants to uh, take the kingdom from his father. And the reason why he wasn't so happy with his dad is because his dad did nothing to revenge this wrong against his own daughter. And, you know, uh, I guess we'll, we'll never find out why. It's just in a difficult situation, I guess. But Absalom took it to a, to a degree where he really shouldn't have taken it to a good degree. But this is where we're at in this chapter. Absalom, as we know, after he killed or had his brother killed, he flees to a place called Gesher to hang out with his grandfather there in exile. After three years uh, with some... Uh, help with uh, David's uh, commander-in-chief, uh, the commander of the army. Um, David restores Absalom, but wants nothing to do with him, does want nothing to do even seeing his face. So he restores him back to Jerusalem. But two years after that, Absalom began to uh, uh, want to see his father. And, and, of course, that situation came about. David saw him. He came in. We know the story there. David, again, restores him to all, his, uh, all the royalties that is deserving of a prince. And really, he's the next in line to be the king. But as he does this, he begins to undermine David. And we began in chapter 15 where we saw that. He began to undermine his dad's rule. He began to steal the hearts of the people. And let me tell you, if anybody can steal your heart, there's a, you need to check it. If anybody can steal your heart away, and, and that's in any kind of relationship that you're in, you need to check your own heart. No one should have to steal your heart. And this is exactly what Absalom do. He really played the people as fools, the way he did it. And he stole the hearts of the people. Uh, look at 13 and 14. It says there, now a messenger, chapter 15, 13 and 14. Now a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. So David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. David wasn't so much worried about his own life, but David again is a man after God's own heart. And God's own heart is for the people, the people that he loved so much. And David wanted to protect the city and protect the people from what he knew his son could accomplish in this revengeful treason that he was committing. 
And it was with that message, and it was with Absalom himself, who will eventually declare himself as king, that David says, let's pack up and let's go. Let's remove ourselves from this city. It is there in Psalm 3, if you would turn there, Psalm chapter 3, where David wrote, dealing with this offense of his son. There in Psalm 3, it says, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him and God. That's exactly what Absalom wanted the people to begin to believe. Hey, there is no help for King David. Uh, uh, You know, there is no help at all for him and God. And then he says, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. You're the lifter of my head. I I love singing that song. He says, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord, sustained me. He he, uh, revived me. He upheld me. He first, he speaks of God helping him. In verses 1 and 2, and now God uh, revives him, he upholds him, he sustains him, he supports him. He says in verse 6, I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, verse 7, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Uh, He saves him. He helps him. He delivers him. But notice right before this psalm in in the the description, it says this was a psalm when he fled from Absalom, his son. And so David is a writer. He's a a songwriter. He's a psalm writer. He's he's one who likes to journal. And and lo and behold, whether he realized it or not, uh, it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. His writings would be collected and here we have him in the Bible. But back to Second Samuel, after dealing with his offense, after realizing that his son is against him, we pick it up where David is in the process of evacuating. He's in the process of leaving. And I remind you also that the people who really gathered around David, most of the people that would go with David were Gentiles, where his own people fell for Um, Absalom's words and his own people betrayed him as well and we'll look at that here uh, a bit but picking it up there in verse 23 it says there and all the country wept with a loud voice and all the people crossed over the king himself also crossed over the brook Kidron first time that is mentioned in the Bible and all the people crossed over toward the way of the wilderness. They're, they're going uh, there across this Kidron Valley. Now, here we see that David and his people are crossing, which leads, by the way, to the Mount of Olives. That's where he's headed. We'll see that in the, in the next verses here. Um, and the word Kidron means dark. It's interesting when you read of that word. Uh, uh, dark as, as, in a, as in color, of course, but uh, this is a dark situation for David. This is, a, this is a very dark time. This is a dark time for David's life and David's career and as David as the king. I mean, the scene reminds us, doesn't it, of the Lord's own experience when he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, which, by the way, is adjacent to the Mount of Olives. If you have a, a Bible in, in the back of your, or excuse me, if you have a map in the back of your Bible, uh, if you have some kind of... Uh, Bible that costs a little bit, you may have a map, and, and there you can see where, where Mount of Olives is and, and where the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. But I guess what I'm trying to say is this, friends. It was a dark time for Christ as well. It was a dark time for the Lord, for he knew where he was going. He knew he was headed for the cross. And here is David also being betrayed. David also going across this same um, uh, Kidron Brook, this over this brook that that Jesus would go over as well, and it just reminds me of the experience of our Lord uh, went through in John eighteen one. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, 
where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So same, same kind of trek, same footsteps of King David. Jesus crossed over, although Jesus, again, went to the garden, and David is going to the, the wilderness. He is going to the Mount of Olives. But I wonder, I wonder, as our Lord was crossing over the Kidron Valley, if he thought about David, and he thought about the life of David. He knew he was the son of David, the true son of David that was to come. He knew that he, was, he came to earth to fulfill and to, to uh, be that title, the son of David. We know that. But I wonder if he thought of David and how he left Jerusalem. Uh, I wonder if those were in his own thoughts because how David was betrayed and how Jesus was betrayed as well. And Jesus, knowing that at that very hour, as he's crossing over, that Judas, one of his own disciples, was betraying him and arranging for his arrest. Also remember the time where Jesus was crossing over, the time when Jesus was going over the brook Kidron to uh, the garden, was Passover time. And there was not only water that was flowing through the Kidron, but there was also what? Blood. There was also blood. And they had these apparatuses, the, uh, uh, these, these uh, type of uh, apparatuses where the blood would flow through these canals that would go right through to, the, to this brook. And as Jesus is passing over, get the, get the word picture, he's passing over, he's seeing water and blood. He's seeing the blood of the lambs. But this is the true lamb of God. This is the true lamb. There's no blemish in him. There's no sin within him. He is approved of his father. He is the one who's come to give his life. And he's crossing over only as he knows to be, to be turned over to, uh, the, and be arrested and on his way to the cross as we know that. And here all these lambs are being slaughtered and he's walking across the brook and in his own heart he knows I'm being betrayed by my own and I'm being betrayed by one who I dipped and ate bread with. So, moving on in verse 24, notice this. I love this. Uh, I don't know if the word cute is, is appropriate here, but, uh, but I love this guy, Zadok, because check it out in verse 24. It says, there was Zadok also and all the Levites with him, um, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. So, thank God not, not all of his brethren uh, betrayed him there were some that went with him but most of them Jesus sent back but it's interesting but he says notice bearing the ark of of God let's go guys you know there's the priest taking the ark of God they're following Jesus or following David out out of Jerusalem and uh and they set down the ark of God and and Abathar went up until all the people had finished crossing over from the city. I just love this gesture because this priest, he knew that Absalom did not have a heart for God. He knew that Absalom could care less. He didn't have a relationship with God. And he knew that this, this ark, in his own mind, in his own heart, he, he knew that this, the ark of the covenant, it, it should be where, uh, where, the, where the anointed king was, where the one who, who, who was after God's own heart, the one who, who loved God, the one who worshiped God, the spirit-filled king. He just felt like this is where it needs to be. It needs to be with the king. I love that gesture. It was a kind gesture. It was a, a blessed gesture. But then verse 25, it says, Then the king said to Zadok, carrying the ark of God back into the city, if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. I love this. David knew the ark belonged in the place where God was to be worshipped. David is seeing this, I believe, for the people themselves. It, it, it wasn't the people's fault that Absalom rebelled against him, most of the people. 
David saw this, that they do, they're doing it out of ignorance. They're, they're, they're buying into Absalom's word. You, you remember he would hang out by the gate and said, oh, if I was only king, I would take care of your problems. Oh, if I was only the king, you wouldn't have to wait so long. And, you know, that, they bought into that. It was just like he was the campaigner, the ultimate campaigner, kissing the babies and, and everything. And they bought into that, and David knew, you know, these people are being fooled. And, and yet, you know, I don't want the Ark of the Covenant being taken out. I, I want the presence of God to be there where God would, would, would show himself to the high priest. Uh, we know that once a year. And, uh, and, and he just, he wanted them not to be, this Ark to be removed. It wasn't the people's fault that Absalom rebelled. Many out of ignorance followed Absalom, yet not knowing what they were doing in betraying King David. Same as our Lord on the cross, as he said, Lord, they know not what they're doing. They don't realize what they're doing. You know, those who put Christ on the cross, although he went willingly. He says, if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord. I love this. I love David's faith here. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he'll bring me back to show me the ark. He'll bring me back to, so I can go into the dwelling place, the temple, that I can worship him there. But if he says this, I have no delight in you, here I am, let him to do to me as seems good to him. I mean, I just love his faith and how he shows us how to restrong, respond to betrayal. And that's a difficult response. We, 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 want a, we want revenge, right? Let's just be honest. We want revenge. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. He's showing us. No, it's not about revenge. Who, who handles revenge for us, guys? God does. It's, it's scripture. And here David is not dealing with revenge. And again, a, a difficult situation. It's his own son. You know, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced a close family member that has betrayed you. But David places his life in God's hands. For whatever reason this event is being allowed to happen, David is saying, God is my defense. God is my judge. That's what he's saying. If I've done wrong, God, here I am. Strike me. If not, then you're my defense, God. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust in you. This is faith and trust in God's will. This is what David is, is living believes in and he's also showing the people how to respond and showing us tonight through the Holy Spirit how to respond to revenge yes we want to get our hands around their neck yes we want to we want to stab back but that's not that's not what the Lord would have us to do and it is difficult guys don't get me wrong I'm, you know uh, but if he finds favor in the Lord's eyes then you know he'll bring me back yeah. that's dedication not resignation He's not resigning. He's not turning his back. He's, it's just total dedication. Uh, I'm, I'm dedicated to the Lord. So whatever it may be, may be. In verse 27, then the king also said to Zadok, the priest, are you not a seer? Are you not a prophet? Uh, do you not have the gift of prophecy? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahimaaz, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abathar, he says, Verse 28, see, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So not only was Zadok the, uh, the priest, but he was also, also one who had this gift of prophecy. Uh, as David calls him, he was a seer. And, and David is telling him that he is a greater value to him in Jerusalem than with him, with the king. Take the ark back, put it back in its proper place, Go back to Jerusalem. Stay there. You're a seer. You know, seek God through this, through this gift, but also be my eyes and ears. And, and, and these other guys, too, the, your son Jonathan and Abathar, you guys are more value to me there. If there's any warning order, if anything takes place, a word of importance that I need to know, then inform me. Send them to me and keep me updated. That's his recon. That's his, that's his you know, I love this. Uh, and we'll see this happen as we continue in the other chapters, that this exa exactly will take place as, as, 
as Absalom is continuing to plan against David, David will get word. David will get warning orders that this is going on and you need to move on and things like that. And, and therefore, verse 29, they were obedient to the king. They realized that what the king said was wise. And so Zadok and Abathar carried the ark of God back. You know, I'm just thinking how the people are looking. Where are they going with that thing? You know, doom, 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 doom. You know, let's go back into the Holy of Holies, man. You know, and, and they're taking it back, uh, back, to, uh, back to Jerusalem. And they remained there. You see, David did not want also, I believe, to make the same mistake as King Saul. Remember when Saul took the Ark of the Covenant out with him? Remember that to battle? Again, here was a man that really wasn't dedicated to God. Here was a man that started well but didn't end well, King Saul. And he really didn't have respect for God. Uh, as he continued on, he used the Ark as a, as a luck charm, as a rabbit's foot. How many of you remember rabbit's, rabbit's foot? You're old, and you're old, and you're old. David worshipped, uh, did not worship the God, well, David worshipped the God of the ark, not God that does not dwell, not a God that dwells in boxes made by hands. Heaven is his throne, and earth is his footstool. David didn't need the ark of the covenant to continue to worship and obey the Lord, although it was an uh, furniture that was holy but David could worship God just for who he was and his presence with him always and so take it back don't don't allow the people not to have a place of worship not to worship God it's not their fault they know not what they do and so it says David went up verse 30 he went up about a mile from Jerusalem to the ascent of Mount of Olives. And, we, and, and he wept as he went up. I can just, that scene, just get that scene in your mind. He's barefoot. He's walking toward the Mount of Olives. He's taking the ascent of the Mount. He's weeping. He's weeping over the wickedness and the rebellion of his son. No doubt he's weeping over the betrayal of these people, that they're believing a lie, that they're, 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 they're falling for this, this false words, this, this false campaign from his son. But also, I've got to believe that he's also weeping, as, as many times we do, over, over his own sins, the consequence of his own sin. Oh, if I, if I would just have went down to my room, if I just went out, even better, went out to war, with our man. All this would not have happened. Not condemnation, but just looking back and just thinking all this tragedy, all this betrayal was based upon that one look, that one lustful look, the second look, and then the action of David and Bathsheba. And so he's weeping. He's crying. It says there that he he has his head covered. That's a sign of what? of mourning. He's mourning. It's a deep weeping then. It's something very deep. Many of us have experienced the death of a close loved one. It's that deep, deep well of weeping that's in us. And, and he went barefoot. Again, that's a sign of one who's going into captivity. He's, he just feels like, you know, this is, this is where I'm at. Uh, he goes barefoot. A king shouldn't be barefoot, but he feels like he's going into captivity. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. This just shows their love for David. Those who went with him. Those who gathered around him. Again, most were Gentiles. Not all, but most were Gentiles. And they, they loved King David. They loved him. And they wept when the king wept and they mourned when the king mourned and, and, and that's a great thing to do for one another scripture tells us that let us weep with those who weep let us rejoice with those who rejoice let us be glad together and if this trick that he went on I mean it's as if nothing could get worse but it did get what it did David is given some more bad news I and mean, he's just one hit after another but I love the fact is this, that David never stopped being king. 
as hard as it was, the nights of weeping, the nights of mourning, the walk, this, this walk of, of, of weeping and mourning, he never stopped being king. The anointing was still upon him. He didn't resign, as I said. He stood there until God would take him out. But it's as if things couldn't get any worse. Here comes a betrayal by a companion. Look at verse 31. And then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. I believe when he heard that word Ahithophel, it was just as, as I said, that that knife that was in his back was just being turned and turned around and just being cut even deeper and deeper. deeper. Now, we were introduced to Ahithophel earlier in this chapter, but I remind you that he was David's counselor. He was the one who counseled David. He was a part of his close inner group. Um, and he was thought of as one of David's closest friends. Closest friends. And as David hears of this betrayal, man, he must just have hurt him even deeper. In fact, Psalm 55, many believe David was writing about Ahithophel. It speaks of this incident. It speaks of this agony over the loss of and betrayal by a dear friend. Has that ever happened to you? Have you had a real dear friend who just betrayed you, who went against you? Psalm 55, 12 through 14 says this. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide myself from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We who had sweet fellowship together, walked in the house of God in the throng. Imagine that. Another psalm says we, we ate together. We, we, we broke bread together. And you guys know this. And In Israel and even today, eating together is a very intimate part of life there. Right? You, you would eat and sop and, and dip and double dip and things like that. And it just gave a, a sense of real intimacy, real close friendship, real, real close. And this is the man who has now betrayed him. And David asks, oh, oh, Lord, I, I pray, I pray, Lord, you turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness because he knew the wisdom at one time of Ahithophel and how he helped David in his counsel. He quickly turns to prayer. I like that. When he hears this other bad news, he, he turns to prayer and asking God to bring static to any counsel that Ahithophel may bring to Absalom. Again, I remind you of this man, Ahithophel. He was the father of Eliam, 2 Samuel 23, 34. Eliam was the father of Bathsheba, 2 Samuel eleven three, making Ahithophel the grandfather of who? Of Bathsheba, of course. So I believe this is it. This is the reason why he, he went after David. This is the reason why he betrayed David. Because David betrayed his granddaughter. And David had his granddaughter. Uh, his grandson-in-law, you could say, killed, murdered. He had a bone to pick with David, but he didn't confront him on this great sin. He should have confronted him. He should have went before him. He should have confronted him for his granddaughter and his grandson. Instead, he went behind his back. He's seeking revenge rather than justice and truth. David was his friend. He could have talked to David. He could have, he could have brought... He could have brought things to David and against David. He could have done this the right way. But instead, he sought revenge. The Bible is clear with us as Christians how we are to approach another who has offended us. And hey, if it's criminal, then let, let the, the law handle it, of course. If it's criminal, if someone has done something against you, the state usually has a, has a way of, of dealing with that. But if it's personal... It's a, it needs a personal intervention, if possible, for reconciliation. You know, turn to Matthew 18. Let's just look at this real quick because, I don't know, it's something that the Lord spoke to me, so I'm going to speak it to you. <laughs> Matthew 18, you're familiar with this. It's very clear. Matthew 18, verse 15. Maybe I'm speaking to someone today. 
Maybe you want revenge. Maybe you're not willing to go the biblical way. Friend, I'm just telling you, we need to go the biblical way. And I know sometimes it is difficult, but it's God's word, it's God's way, and God will be glorified by it. There in Matthew 18, verse 15, you know this. Moreover, if your brother, that's a believer in Christ, sins against you, and it happens, doesn't it? He says what? Go stab him in the back. No. No. It says, go and tell him his fault. But also it says, between who? Between you and him. What does that mean? That means it's private. That means it's, it's just you and him alone. It doesn't mean you bring a whole posse with you. You know, dun da da dun da da dun da da dun da da dun da You know, you don't bring Haas and, and Paul and, and every. <laughs> how many of you remember? How many of you remember? Okay, old. But anyway, uh, it's you and that person, okay? That's you go and you get alone with them. And if he hears you, you have gained your brother. I love that. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now, sometimes he'll hear you or she'll hear you, but then she needs time or he needs time to, to, to kind of, let me, let me have some time. Let me. Let me think about this, you know. And uh, but at least he heard you. At least he gave ears to you. And, and, and pray through it that there is repentance. Give him time to resolve the issue in his heart. And hopefully he will return to you broken and repentant. It says, if he hears you, you have gained your brother. 16, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Here, here you are bringing witnesses. And guys, these are mature Christians, believers who understand biblical process. These aren't guys with broken noses. These aren't guys that you pick up in New Jersey. I'm going to get a couple of guys, get a couple of homeboys to go over, a couple of cholos to go over there with me. And we're going to break his legs. No, that's not what it's about. These are mature Christians, believers who understand the biblical process, who may have witnessed the same sin described by the original person or not, but know the Bible, what the Bible says, and will speak reason to this person. It says here, hopefully, he'll hear you, but if he refuses to hear them, then tell it to the church. What does that mean? Does that mean... You get up in front of everybody and say, so-and-so has sinned against me. I've gone through the process, and that person has still not repented. Is that, is that what it says? Is that what it means? What does it mean? The leadership. That's right. You go to the elders. Now, sometimes, man, I just, I just want to review this real quick, but sometimes we may already know because the person says, look it, I don't know what to do. I says, let's go back to the process. Matthew, go and go and speak to that person. We should be the last people that you come to. But you come to a pastor, you want to speak to us, you want to speak to an elder first and kind of get some wisdom and, and we'll direct you back to the word of God and back to that person. Um, but that's what it means, yeah. Then the elders are involved with it now. But if he refuses even to hear the church, well, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. In other words, we are to then you know, how did Jesus treat the heathen and tax collector? You know, think about that. Uh, one person said, we are to evangelize this person, even though he's a believer already. The person needs to be in the word. The person needs to be treated like a heathen and a tax collector. And how do we treat heathens and tax collectors? Well, look how Jesus treated them. And he loved them and he ate with them. But, uh, you know, this just means that at this point, you know, they're just not ready to listen. They're, 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 they're not, you know, ready to repent. They're not ready to. So what do you do, man? You know, turn them over to the Lord. Turn them over, you know, mark them. Because they're not beyond God's grace. And pray for them. Anyway, that's just a quick, that's very quick. And, and maybe we didn't do justice in that, but. This is something, though, that we have to learn as believers, that there are biblical ways for us to handle these things, that God is the one who revenged. God is the one who brings revenge for us. Put it in God's hand. Trust God. 
and pray that things work out well. Friends, I've been there. I've been, I've been betrayed by men in the ministry. And uh, the difficulty of coming up on a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night to teach while going through these things, my wife and I and some others in this church. And I tell you, it's not easy. But when you rely on the Holy Spirit, you know you're called to, to the ministry. He gets you through. He gets you through those difficult times. I've had people turn their chairs around on me. I've had people get up and walk. I've had people bring all kinds of, and you know, I was like, Lord, you know, don't, don't think I don't want to get revenge, but I just left it in the Lord's hands. He is my defense. And it's not difficult. It's not, it's not I mean, it's not easy. People have come up to me and said, what's your side of the story? Brother, I don't have a side of the story, man. But Lord, I'm going to trust the Lord for this. And he is so great when we do it by the word. Anyway, back to uh, verse 32, wrap this up. There in 32, notice not only does David trust God, not only does he rely upon God to be his defense, not only does he pray to God, but notice here it says, now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain. There he is, the Mount of Olives, where he worshiped God. He worshiped God. How many times have we forgotten to do one or all of these in our trouble and unrest? How many times have we, we just kind of forgot to, to uh, realize that we can trust God or, or rely upon God or even pray? How many times have we forgotten? Not abandon God, but during trials and tribulations. How many times have we forgotten to, to, to go to God? You know, we go to everyone else, we go to everything else, but we, we kind of miss God sometimes. I'm not saying we abandon God during trials and tribulations, but so many times we tend not to just drop everything and pray. Let's just pray right now. Right now is the time of prayer. To stop everything and worship God with wet eyes. To, to, to pause and take our eyes off the situation and on the Lord. To look up and know where our help comes from. See, David's teaching this tonight. He's teaching us this. This is a man who's going through a lot, guys. He's going through a lot. And through these verses, he's teaching us much. Well, moving on. And it says that as he gets to the top of the mountain where he worshiped God, there was Hushai, the archite, uh, coming to meet him with his robe torn and his dust on his head. He, he's mourning just as the king is. I mean, he's just, he's just broken just as much as David is. And David said to him, if, if you go on with me, then, then you will become a burden to me. Gee, thanks, Dad. You know, kind of. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously. So I will now also be your servant. And you may defeat the counts of Ahithophel for me. You can be the one who defeats the council. See, did David trust God? Absolutely he did. But David is also wise to realize, as the king, that he, he has this gift of, of sending people and knowing their strengths, knowing their gifts. And here he's, I trust God, but I'm also a man uh, of war. I'm also a king. I have these gifts that God has given to me. And so, you know, uh, there are some practical things that I can do, still trusting God, absolutely. Not resigning, but just still trusting God in the gifts that he's given to me and the people that he's put in my life. He says, you return to the city. You go back there. You're better for me there. And then you may help me defeat the counts of Ahithophel. Which tells me again, guys, that Ahithophel was a great, wise man for David. And then, verse 35, and do you not have Zadok and Abathar, the priest, with you there? Therefore, it will be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall tell Zadok and Abathar, the priest. And indeed, they have there with them their two sons. And by them, you shall send me everything you hear. And it says, so Hushai, David's friend, went into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. So now he has invaded Jerusalem. Now he's 
in Jerusalem. We'll pick that up later. But, but David, brokenhearted. David knew he was still king. David knew he was still in service for God. David continued to be practical and smart, having ears and eyes in the city, caring for the people, caring for their welfare, protecting those who are with him now at the Mount of Olives. He never stopped trusting God. But, but God, using his, the anointing that is upon him, God who had anointed him to be this king, doing these, these practical things while believing God for the victory. Believe in God for the victory. I like this uh, quote by Oliver Cromwell. How many of you know who Oliver Cromwell was? He was a, an English military and political leader. He said this. He says, put your trust in God, boys, and keep your powder dry. That's balance. That's wise. That's wisdom. Yes, I trust God. But boys, keep your powder dry because the fight may come to us. Or we may go to the fight, but we still trust God. We trust God in everything. And this Hushai, he was a friend. And that friend stays. He stays with you through your mistakes. He stays with you through your difficulties. He stays with you through your ups and downs. He stays with you through your life, both domestically and professionally, as a real friend. He's that friend we talked about last time. But when everybody else leaves, he's there. He's there encouraging you. He's there lifting you up and encouraging you in the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you, God, for this time in the word as the team comes up, Lord, to, to cap off this night with worship. And that's what we want to do. We want to worship you, God. We ask, God, that you just continue to guide and direct us, God, and use us, Lord. Give us wisdom, Lord. Help us, help us to be biblical people, God. Help us to be wise, Lord, God. And I speak for myself as well. So many times we so many times we don't go to the Word. So many times we don't go to prayer, God. So many times we stretch it out, Lord, and want to do things our own way. And at the end of that, we realize your way is always better, God. Help us with that, Lord. Ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you leave tonight, the prayer team will be up. If you need prayer for anything you're going through, you don't have to go to details. You don't have to. They're here. They want to intercede with you. We'll be here hanging out as well. God bless you guys.